We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. reading from 1st Corinthians chapter 6 verses 12 to 20. The lesson is entitled Use Your Body for God's Glory. Someone will say, I am allowed to do anything. Yes, but not everything is good for you. I could say that I am allowed to do anything, but I am not going to let anything make me its slave. Someone else will say, food is good for the stomach, and the stomach is good for food. Yes, but God will put an end to both. The body is not to be used for sexual immorality, but to serve the Lord, and the Lord provides for the body. God raised the Lord from death, and he will raise also us by his power. You know that your body is are parts of the body of Christ. Shall I take a part of God's body and make it a part of the body of a prostitute? Impossible. Or perhaps you don't know that the man who joins his body to a prostitute becomes physically one with her. The scripture says quite plainly, the two will become one body. But he who joins himself to the Lord becomes spiritually one with him. Avoid immorality. Any other sin a man commits does not affect his body, but the man who is guilty of sexual immorality sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Listen to the good news. Proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter, beginning at the 43rd verse. Glory to Christ, our Saviour. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, 
You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I don't know how many of you know the song uh, by Carol King called Where You Lead. Um, it is quite a, a oldish song for the generations that are quite youngish. But how I came to know the song is through the program, The Gilmore Girls. It was a theme song. 
and it is one of the songs that I really use a lot when I'm struggling to be obedient like Mary. The lyrics are, where you lead, I will follow, anywhere you tell me to. If you need, you need me to be with you, I will follow where you lead. If you're out on the road, feeling lonely and so cold, all you have to do is call my name and I'll be there on the next train. I think these lyrics are so applicable and parallel the way that we see the disciples today. We see Philip and Nathaniel in an interesting dialogue with Jesus. It challenges us to think what it means to follow Jesus. And I suppose the sense in every sermon is about what it means to follow Jesus. But here today, I would like to draw your attention to four aspects from this dialogue and interaction. In the Gospel of John, John records for us setting the scene as Jesus decides to head for Galilee and that's when his encounter with Philip begins. The first point we notice is that it's actually very easy to miss. Right at the beginning of the story, Jesus says, or John says, Jesus found Philip. At the truth of every Christian story is not that you and I have found Christ, but rather that Christ has found us. We did not decide for God, God called us. And our narratives and narratives in scripture show that the Bible is full of God who is constantly calling out his people. This is the beginning of scripture. And if you remember clearly in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit realizing they were naked and embarrassed and they hid. And what happens in verse 8 is that God is walking out in the garden and calling out for Adam and Eve in verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Right from the beginning of time, God has been seeking us out and finding us. So let us never think that we chose God. He chooses us. As Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, he says, for, I ha for he has chosen us to be in him before the creation of the world. And this is important because the knowledge that God has sought uh, us out rather than we seeking him out is crucial in keeping us humble before God. Even our own faith is not our own decision. So once Jesus finds Philip, he issues a single command, follow me. And we need to put Jesus as number one in our lives. And this is what is demanded of us as Christians. Philip is compelled to follow Jesus. In fact, he leaves everything else behind. His work, his family, his possessions, his ambitions. It all goes and he follows Jesus. Following Jesus is a very radical commitment that demands every single aspect of our being. And often we can get it wrong from time to time or we don't quite meet the ideal. And it's because radical discipleship should always be before us. We notice what Philip did when he sent out to follow Jesus. Did he go on an alpha course? No. Did he join a church? No. Did he get baptized? No. The first thing, according to John, was to find his brother Nathaniel and tell him about Jesus. The first rule of being a disciple of Jesus is very simple. Tell other people about Jesus. And what is so beautiful, I think, is that Philip didn't have this great academic learning. He wasn't a great theologian, studied for many, many years. In fact, he was still effective in being an evangelist for Jesus. And I've just said how God finds us and not the other way around. But let's look at what Philip says to Nathaniel. We have found him about whom Moses in the law wrote. Wow. Wow. Well, Philip's theology might not be great, but Jesus found him. He didn't find Jesus. Nevertheless, he's effective in bringing Nathaniel to Jesus. And so often we think we can't tell people about Jesus because we don't know our Bible verses and we can't quote the scripture off our lungs, heart and liver. And some of us feel very intimidated by the questions that people ask. But do you know what? None of that matters. And we don't even need to be theologians 
and study with degrees to be effective in evangelizing. We just need to be passionate for Jesus and he will do the rest. So, what do we need to do? One, be a follower of Jesus. What does it mean? We will be found by him. Two, to be a follower of Jesus means to tell others about him. And three, to be a follower of Jesus means keep going on despite the knocks that we take. You see, Nathaniel's response to Philip was not particularly encouraging, is it? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip had just come, come running over to Nathaniel, passionate about sharing this good news about Jesus, only to be met with real, a real cynical response. And sometimes we can tell people about Jesus and we met without a doubt, doubt, cynic, cynicism, rudeness, apathy, and it can really hurt our souls. It can knock our self-confidence, even really hurt our self-esteem, our pride. But when it happened to Philip, he didn't get into some theological debate about the merits of Nazareth as a geographical area or its place within the salvation of the history of Israel or anything. He just said, Nathaniel, come and see. When it comes to evangelism, that's all we need to keep saying. Come and see. We don't need to get involved in discussions and debates and try to win people over. We don't even need to debate for God. Instead, we just should say, if you don't believe me, try it for yourself and see. Come and see and let God handle the rest. And there's a real challenge to ask the church here this morning because while it may be a rhetorical question, Many people do respond to the come and see because when they do come and see, what is it that they find? People often receive a warm welcome. Or do they? Will they get a sense of God changing their lives or not? Will they have an experience of worship that makes them feel that love of Jesus Christ gives them access to God? Or do they go away with a sense of excitement that something is happening here? That they've experienced something different? That moment of changing in their faith? The question for us here this morning at St. Paul's and St. Joseph's is, is Jesus the center? And if people from the outside, in this time of greatest need and greatest desperation, where people are searching for answers and are losing hope daily. If they come to us at St. Paul's and St. Joseph's, will they meet with God? It's all good questions for us to ponder on our mission for Peter Maritzburg and Glenwood and Eastwood and our action plans that unfold. But being a disciple means being found by God. Being a disciple means telling others about him, about Jesus. Not planning big, elaborate things, but being a disciple means not losing hope or confidence when the message doesn't always come through in an articulate way. But it means telling others about Jesus. Lastly, being a disciple means receiving peace and blessing from God. You see, Jesus' response to Nathaniel is very interesting. He says to him, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he says of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asks him, Why did you come to know me? And Jesus answers, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now there are two things to be said here. First, it has to do with the word see. And there are different Greek words in the Bible for this. Philip said to Nathanael, Come and see. And the Greek word here has to do with the use of the eyes. We look and we see something. In the physical. But the second word see is used here in regard to the passage in which Jesus says, Jesus saw Nathaniel um, coming to him and says, I saw you under the fig tree. And in those occasions, a different Greek word here is used. What is the word meaning? It means not physical, but spiritual perception. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him. He saw into his heart as he approached and recognized him for who he truly was. 
Secondly, we read here Jesus' word, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you, which suggests that Jesus knew Nathaniel before this encounter, not in the physical sense of having seen him before, but more in a spiritual sense of having his hand on Nathaniel's life before that encounter from all eternity. Yes, Jesus found Nathaniel just as he found Philip, even though both Philip and Nathaniel thought they had found Jesus. And here's a real sense of peace that we can derive from the knowledge that God has had his hand on us even before we were aware. And remember what scripture tells us, I knit you together in your mother's womb. It's interesting that Jesus says this, I saw you under the fig tree. It is a phrase that is used three other times in the Bible. In 1 Kings chapter 4, 25, Micah 4 verse 4, Zechariah 3, 10. So for example, 1 Kings, during Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel who lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree, and each time that phrase is used, sitting under the fig tree is a symbol of living in peace and blessing which is an obedient relationship, which only God can provide. In this gospel reading, Jesus is perceiving Nathanael's obedience of a well-lived Jewish life. He says, here is an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Meaning, Nathanael has known the peace and blessings of God in his life. And in a relationship with Jesus, there is even more for Nathanael to receive. Far more than obedience to Jewish law could ever ever give him and Jesus says do you believe because I told you what I that I saw you under the fig tree you will see greater things than these I think Jesus is commending him for having been an obedient Jew but he's also calling Nathaniel into a deeper place of peace and blessing through a relationship with him as Christians we know that peace and blessing can only derive from our relationship with Jesus and the more we allow Jesus to be the center of our lives the more we will know peace in our heart. We are called into a life of peace and blessing with God. And Jesus sees us. He knows everything about us and perceives our deepest needs. And if we follow him, as he says to Nathaniel, we will see heaven opened. Today, church, we are called to follow. Today, we come and we will see. Amen.
heart The mystery he lavishes on us Is deep, cries out too deep Oh how desperately he wants us The things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun Unfailing Father What compares to His great love Behold His holy son Oh, oh. 
Behold 